<laughs> Nate, I can't believe we're almost at the end of quarter one. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> almost 25% of the way through the year. And, you know, we've had some great episodes already this year. Two of my favorites are the ones that we actually recorded at Brooklyn Music Factory at the end of last yeah, year. Yeah. And when I was in New York slash Brooklyn, uh, Nate's a generous guy. Uh, the two times that I've come to hang out with Nate at Brooklyn Music Factory, he has so graciously let me stay at his place. We've had a good time hanging out together. And uh, actually, we're kind of both generous guys. One of the things we always <laughs> ask folks who are watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast is, please send in your questions. We would love to answer questions. And, and, and just personally, it I have so much more energy around answering questions than just like sitting here in my office and coming up with episode topics. And many of the things that we've talked about have either come from clients we're working with or questions that have been sent into us by the audience or questions that I see being asked in Facebook groups or in other forums where music school owners hang out. Today's episode is one that has come directly from a music school owner. Uh, someone wrote into us, they asked a really great question. Nate and I chatted about it for a while thought, hey, not only is there one episode here, there's probably multiple episodes here, and we're probably going to do a second episode on this topic in the near future. But I'm just going to read the question or, or how I condense the question right here at the top of the episode. The question was, how would you mentor an employee to get them to a place where they can make a decision on a difficult situation? And they gave a little more context on what they meant about that. And we're going to go, we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the episode. But that's the topic. That's what we're covering today. And I think we have a lot to say on mentoring employees, what it looks like to delegate effectively, the conditions and structures that must be in place in your school to make this happen, where you can sleep easy at night knowing someone is taking full responsibility for entire departments in your school or entire areas of responsibility in your school. We're going to talk about all that today. So welcome back to the podcast. I'm Daniel. This is Nate, and it is our joy to talk about how to build a great, awesome, fun-to-run school that is really, really profitable. Nate, you've mentored quite a few employees over the years, team members over the years. What does mentoring mean to you? Let's just start by putting a basic definition out there. Yeah. Mentoring to me, Daniel, um, is about essentially like a taking and giving, i.e. you have someone in your organization that you personally are gonna take on whatever challenges they have, and you are gonna give your best possible advice on how to overcome those. Sometimes the challenge is literally just understanding the culture of the company they're at, the school you're in, and just you being there for them and saying, how can I take on whatever suffering or challenges you're facing, and then actually be a benefit to you, help you get past that so that you can find joy on the workplace. Uh, the perspective I have on mentoring is for my high level team members, the ones that are most crucial to this business or other businesses I'm running are, is that I want to take a person that has a lot of energy for our mission and the direction we're going. And I want to spend time with that person, figure out what makes them tick and put them into alignment and the right roles and areas of responsibility that will most use their giftings and strengths for the benefit of not only the business, but more importantly, the customers that we're serving. So helping them have a vision for something just bigger than, oh, this is my job that I go to every day, but kind of equipping them. And what that often looks like is just, in its broadest definition, just spending time with them. But a great recent example here is that um, Great Music Studio launched an Instagram account. And you, if you have an Instagram account, if you're listening, go to grow.studio on Instagram and just give us a follow. And I will tell you that a huge part of that Instagram account launching was because of Bethany, who has worked for me since 2020. And we spent an entire year prior to that launch just doing a lot more social media marketing. And I'm going to get into this later in the episode. So I'm not going to steal the thunder from that. But we spent so much time just talking about this that it that it eventually be, it became inevitable that it happened. So 
anyway, that's kind of my definition of mentoring, just spending a lot of time with that person unto several different purposes in, in different categories. That's that's mentoring to me. Can so, I highlight something oh, you please. said, Daniel, that I that I really appreciated? Um, your point around looking at their strengths, spending enough time with this other human to say, I want to get to know you, and I want to get to know what I didn't pick up on in the hiring funnel, potentially, right? And try to discover their story at a much deeper level. And I love that you added on, like, where where are you uh, very strong and how can we actually put you in positions that align with your strengths? So just wanted to highlight that because I think it's a great addition to this this idea of defining mentoring. Yeah, and I'll say this, and we can save this for an episode on, specifically on mentoring, but when I hired Bethany, neither one of us thought that she would be doing social media marketing. It just came about over time. As she became more, she actually became more passionate for that because of the time we spent together hmm. and yeah. seeing what the business needed. Anyway, so that was one definition I want to get out of the way. So I'm going to reread the question again. How would you mentor an employee to get them to a place where they can make a decision on a difficult situation? So we've defined mentor. I think we need to define one more word or words in there before we can actually get into how we would make this happen in actuality. And that is what is a difficult situation? So I'm just going to read off a list here uh, that Nate and I came up with beforehand. So I'm not stealing Nate's thunder. Most of these no. ideas are his, actually. <laughs> a lot of difficult situations were presented with in any given week. Yeah. So let's think about what a difficult situation would be in a music school. Uh, customer asking for a refund. Customer asking for a makeup or an exception to the cancellation policy. Or potentially just not knowing what the cancellation policy is or they've forgotten it and then they have an expectation and their expectation is not going to be met because they're in gross violation of the school's makeup policy. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm being a little overdramatic. Third, uh, maybe you've got a customer, a client, and and they're unhappy with how their child is performing or performed in a certain context or in a certain situation. So again, there's a mismatch between expectation and reality, but as it pertains to their child. And we all know that no parent has a lot of identity issues around their child. They don't have a lot of emotion around their child, right? This is going to be an easy situation to deal with, of course. All right. Four, um, why don't you give my child more to practice? That's a question that came up for me. I, you know, Nate, this was actually Nate's idea, uh, that one in particular. Um, explaining the why behind certain your school's policies, behind your school's vision, behind just decisions you've made about either the educational component or something that's going on in the school. Maybe you have a program that's been retired. They really like that program. Something new is in its place and they just don't like the, the thing that's it, it's replaced. And so you've got a little bit of a disgruntled parent. And now how do you prep a program? How do you prep a, a team member or employee to deal with that? I'll give one more. Who gets a discount? Why and when do they get a discount? Again, as the owner, you probably know how to deal with all these situations. But how do you equip a team member to deal with these situations? That's that's what we're talking about here. Nate, do you have anything to add before we actually jump into the how and why? No, that is a great difficult situations list. I'm going to add one more that Jessica brings up all the time, which is mm. the inquiry that can be difficult. Oftentimes, as a parent, mm. back to your comment about a parent being emotionally connected with their child, I can't tell you how many times we get inquiries where they, uh, a parent says, but my child's different. Actually, my child is, uh, you know, more talented. Um, mm. they're, they're, they're better in a private lesson rather than in the mini keys program, even though they're only four years old. Right? Right. So anyways, that's another perfect example, even at the top of the funnel. Even at that just inquiry level, you can have difficult questions and difficult situations. So that's a stellar list. Honestly, if it, we can help our listeners tackle even half of those with a team member, I think this episode is going to rock. And actually, I have a thought even on that. There, People might hear that list and be like, how do I deal with that? You know, <laughs> we probably can do a whole episode on how to deal with all those issues. Because you mentioned, you know, the mini keys thing. That is something that frequently came has come up for clients of mine who have switched over to group lessons mm. where they're tr they're learning how to deal with parent pushback on a group lesson structure let alone help a team member to deal with that pushback and i think that's just a good place to mention that one of the sponsors of this podcast is grouplessons.com 
And uh, if you're looking for, as a school owner, if you're looking for a high margin, high quality program to insert in the piano department of your school, you should definitely check out grouplessons.com. The Piano Express curriculum has helped schools see up to 12 students per hour with just one teacher. And uh, we have many more schools doing it now than this time last year. And just a lot of really happy folks. Anyway, we let's at? define what done looks like. How do we know that a team member is ready to handle this? Okay, so you'll you'll know as much as you can that a team member is ready to handle a difficult situation or in general that you're ready to delegate major areas of responsibility to them when you've actually defined their area of responsibility. You don't just throw a random teammate into the fire. You have to have got them to gotten them to the point that they know that they're responsible for that. So what would that look like? Well, if you've got a desk worker who is going to be fielding a lot of questions, especially around some of the things that we just talked about, refunds, makeup, cancellation policies, um, uh, who gets a discount and why. Those are classic front desk or office manager type situations. You, They have to know that they're at a point where they don't need to say, well, let me go get my boss. Let me go get, let me go get, uh, Nate, let me go get Daniel. Let me go get Sarah, right? They know that the buck stops with them. So you've handed the mantle of responsibility over to them. I think that's actually important to say because too often in team situations, I mean, this, ha this has happened within the last couple of weeks as of this recording where three different people potentially could have been responsible for something. And so we were all kind of looking at each other saying, hey, is this you or is this you? And then we had to hammer this out through through email. Now, add to that the tension of maybe high emotions on the part of the client. You do not want a situation where, where someone's either speaking out of turn because you haven't fully given them responsibility or they keep coming back to you and disrupting your work when no, actually, this is yours now. Okay, so that's the first thing. You've clearly defined the area of responsibility. Other way you know is that you've given them specific training on how to deal with these things. This is not just like, oh yeah, this is what we say. And then you tell them once and now they're ready. That is not it. That is not how we do things. And later in this podcast, I'm going to actually, in this episode, I'm actually going to talk about what training looks like specifically, but I'm just going to define it for the time being as you've actually put them, put them through some formal training and they have some formal documentation available to them to know how to handle this situation. That's what training looks like to me. Um, the third thing is that you have given them partial responsibility at some point, or you've given them a few test runs on an area of responsibility, and then you've talked through the results of their decisions. So it's almost like you put them through a trial period and let them know, hey, whatever happens during this period, it it's kind of a... You can, you can have a mulligan on it. If you don't handle it so well now, this is like your test run, you know, the next 14 days or something like that. You've given them, you, you've given them a sandbox to play in and let them know that you are not, okay, so this sounds bad, but you're not judging them as harshly. Truth is you shouldn't be judging anyone harshly, but I think you know what I mean when I'm saying this, right, Nate? Are you picking up what I'm putting down here? That you've basically given them more leeway to fail or to not do a great job so that they don't have a high degree of anxiety as they're going through the roughest part of their training. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you never want to feel like there's a big brother component where we're just watching over them. <laughs> so there's that, the moment you're talking about, I just wrote down on my card, you're developing trust right now at that one specific yes. moment by saying, yeah. hey, you're not alone. You're never actually alone here at BMF. And so for this chapter of training, how right. about you just know you can come to me anytime with a question. Yeah. Right? Now, I know we're talking specifically about these difficult conversation type things. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that we could have even dropped that, enti that entire framing of the episode and just talked about handing off responsibility. This is really more about delegation in general. And I could give a ton of stories right now about specific instances in which I did all three of those things I just mentioned. Um, define their area of responsibility given them specific formal and documented training, and then given them a safe period in which to practice it. Again, that just happened with the Instagram launch that we did back in February. Uh, we had several months leading up to that where we were doing a lot of intense work around that. And, and all three of those things happened with her. 
But again, this is also true if you're training a desk worker to deal with, you know, difficult situation, training a salesperson to talk knowledgeably about the school and make decisions and make promises for the school or the results that the school can get. Like this, this just writ large, this is the process that you do any of these places that you hand delegation off to. Daniel, let me highlight one thing you said there early on, just rewind tape when you talk about mm. AORs, areas of responsibility. First of all, <laughs> episode 83, you and I went through the book, The, C the Great CEO Within, and That's one true. of my favorite chapters that he includes mm. in that book is on area of responsibility. Um, so I highly encourage you to bookmark ep 83, go back and listen to that. You might be inspired to pick up the book. We've had clients that have picked up the book and said, hey, now I'm working through this. I just listened to your episode. Um, but one of the things you said that I want to highlight is that it's really important that you state initially, this is going to be one of your areas of responsibility. Um, I will say that at Brooklyn Music Factory, that's been a struggle for us as we've scaled and grown and Soon. brought on more and more employees. You have to start handing over those areas of responsibility to different people. And it is so important, just that, that first point you said, making sure that you're inking that putting it down in writing. Hey, just so we're all clear, here's the list of all your responsibilities. Dig it? Because that mm. moment you talked about the tension where there's three different potential people like at Grow that are like, yeah. who's actually talking to this issue? That's a very real palpable tension. It very much is, yeah. You know. So anyways, I wanted to highlight that. Can I add two other ideas to this? Um, uh, yes, before you do, I will just say, he mentioned episode 83. You can... Any, any resource that we talk about here in the episode will probably be in the show notes. And to find the show notes, you just need to go to growyourmusicstudio.com slash blog, click the podcast tab, and then find this episode number, which I believe this is going to be episode number 112. Yes, it is 112. So you would just go and find episode 112. You can find all the resources we talk about and references to past episodes there. Easy to find. So Daniel, let's say you're listening and you do all three great steps that you just mentioned, right? Is it? How do you know that you've actually succeeded at the thing, right? So I I, I want to add a couple of a couple of thoughts that I put under this initial question, which was mm. the first thing is um, I love this piece, which is that you don't even <laughs> know that the difficult question was asked anymore. I love this. You know, you don't even know that that question came up. You don't even know that there was a tense um, experience in your waiting room um, that occurred because the person that you've been training and the person that you've been shadowing and the person that has your trust now in that area of responsibility just took care of it right another definition of success is that when you go back because this is an essential step and say hey by the way it's been a month that you've been at this is there anything that you need help with and they say no i got it you're like amen that's what you want. To, you want to hear them say, no, 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 I'm all good. I'll come to you if I have any questions. So anyways, wanted to add those two. Definition of success, if you are doing a good job. Nate, that's fantastic. So here's my next question then. Because if we know what done looks like and we know what we're trying to do, we're trying to delegate an area where we're not having to think about it or we don't even know what came up, which is awesome. How do you get someone to that place? And I think this is the place where most people really park or this is where their mind first goes to, oh, well, how do I do that? So let's actually talk about how uh, what the steps are required to train someone. So I'm just going to give some really high level advice around this point. And this is an outline that, yes, we probably could fill in this outline and do an entire episode around it. But in general, this is how I think about it. And I think if you use this to guide your thoughts around it, you will probably fill in in a different way than I do, but I think all these components must be in place. So first off, you've defined their area of responsibility. I talked about that before, but you start them with easy tasks in that area of responsibility. So to go back to the, yes. the Instagram thing that I was talking about with Bethany, we I didn't start by saying like, hey, I need you to build a whole Instagram account for me. <laughs> we started with one, with her getting familiar with my way of uh, thinking about social media. That involved a lot of talking. That involved me sharing accounts. I was like, I love the way that this business does social media. And then us talking about why I liked it so much. It involved her getting used to my writing style, which happened years ago when, when 
I first started when she first started working for me. Okay, um, more towards the point, uh, some of the, the things that we said earlier. Um, back in the day, I had another team member named Alicia, and she did my invoicing for my music studio. And the first thing I had her do was just get familiar with the software and just start making the invoices for me. That was it. I handled all the special cases. I handled like all the communication with the clients. I knew I had a vision in my mind that eventually she could handle all that. But I just had her start by doing part of the process. That was it. So that even as mistakes were made there, if if some were, and she rarely made any, I'll just say that she rarely made mistakes. But in the in the few events that we did, just talking about why it happened helped me understand her view on the job and what she thought I meant when I said such and such a thing versus what I thought I was communicating. So not only was she learning the job, not only was she learning something in the area of responsibility, we were actually learning how to communicate with each other, which is kind of goes back to the mentoring thing that we were talking about earlier. So so. I think this is important. We define the area of responsibility. We start giving easy tasks or part of the task, the least difficult part of the task in the area of responsibility or in the project or in the system. Then we have them build a manual for the whole thing. Hmm. So actually this could even pre, this could even precede the previous point, depending on whether the system's already in place or not. And, and what I mean by that is I actually had her document the whole invoicing system, but I only had her doing part of what she documented. I was still doing part of it after I'd hired my first assistant for my own studio. But what happened over time was she started taking over more and more of the task, but she had to have it defined as to what the job was. And if again, it is unrealistic to train someone and you know have them write down on a, on a yellow legal pad the steps, have a... Um, maybe a video that shows how to do it where you're just kind of talking and and your steps are out of order because you're doing it stream of consciousness in the video. No, you need something documented, preferably in what we'll just, what I'll just call a manual, a manual for running the school. So that's that. Um, once they document that, they need to send that system to you for verification that it's correct because then if there's a mistake and they were following it, then it's your fault as the owner. And that's very important that they know that it's your fault because if they follow the steps exactly and there's a problem still, then you and you had signed off on the system they sent to you, then that's ultimately the buck stops with you. And that's just another way to make your environment safe for the team members, especially younger ones. Younger, I've noticed that younger team members are as much as quote unquote Gen Z gets a bad rap for being bad employees. Um, <laughs> older generations get a bad rap for being far too demanding and forgetting what it was like to be 22, year, 22 years old or 25 years old or 27 years old. And I will just say that my younger team members have often not been, it's been the opposite of kind of the, the stereotype. They have been hesitant to speak up even when they knew I was wrong. Yeah, <laughs> They've been hesitant to speak up. So it's really important to create a safe environment that they in which they can do their job. And then my last point, and then I want to definitely kick it over to you, Nate, um, is just mentoring after the fact. So the typical, the, the typical pattern that I have is of a task I call just 10, 80, 10, 10% of it is you creating the vision and giving the instructions. 80% of the task is that person actually doing it. And then the last 10% is you checking up and doing any mentoring or giving feedback on on the action, the quality of the action, the speed of the action, or you just seeing like, oh wait, I gave them these instructions, I expected this outcome, they did it perfectly, we got this outcome instead. I think I think we need to go back to the drawing board because we're not quite getting the result we want. Now that probably isn't going to be true in like handing off invoicing to someone or telling someone um, how to politely tell a parent that the cancellation policy is such and such that might be more like where you have a hypothesis about how a marketing system will work. You train a team member on how the marketing system will work, but then you don't get the result you want. Well, that isn't the teammate's fault. You need to go back to the vision and figure out what you, what you told them to do wrong. But anyway, that, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of how you follow that task through. You give vision instructions, they do the work, and then you give, you look at the results and then give feedback to them where it's appropriate that they're, where it's appropriate for them. You're only giving them feedback on how well they did the task. And that's kind of, to me, the last step. So this has been the steps required to train them.
Um, Nate, you might have thoughts on this, or you might have some things you want to add, or you might do things differently at Brooklyn Music Factory, have a different con conception of how to train a, a team member to do something like this. So I'm curious your thoughts. I'm going to do what I oftentimes do, which is highlight some awesome point you've made and then just share how we've sometimes skipped that at BMF and had to pay Ugh. the price. So an awesome point you made was, because <laughs> uh, I wrote it down in my card, take on this card, take time. Why did they make a mistake and not Ugh. meet your expectations? And oftentimes we'll hear from clients like, I don't understand, it's too much work to bring someone else on to do this. I'm just gonna do it myself. But I believe oftentimes that it takes too much work, it's just gonna be faster for me to do it myself, is because they skip that essential step you said. So you bring them on, you mentor them, you train them, you ask them to document something, and then you don't even take the five minutes to review the G-Doc where they documented in the manual. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm guilty of that. I'm like, dude, you've totally got it. And I just want to go back to the thing that I'm interested in right now. So I don't take the extra five minutes. And then the last piece you said is, and then reviewing their work later, right? So now you're on the back last 10%. And you're saying, okay, now we've done an update and I'm going to give you feedback on your the final outcome of the thing. The thing, one of the hardest lessons for me to learn, and I don't really know why, Daniel, was that that last 10% of feedback is what can be the most energizing thing for your teammates. A hundred percent. You know, they just, they want it. I mean, they're busting their ass. They're psyched. They're in it. They're totally part of the team. And then that last 10% you forget to do because it's Friday at five and you're in a rush and you just want to get home to the fam or whatever, you know? And all they needed you to do was watch the 30 second clip of the video and say, man, I love it. Two things I would have, can we update these two things? Like the title card, just fix the typo and this other thing. And they're just, they're just so grateful that you took 30 seconds and slacked them back with a couple notes. I don't know if you've yeah. experienced that yourself, Daniel, but that took me years well, to realize how important it was. Yeah. And first off, this is such a valuable highlight. And and I want to even jump off what you said there and say that it is only with your most senior people that that you can, sometimes don't need to do that last 10%. And this isn't over against the point you're making. This actually is the exception that proves the rule. There are things that Kirsten's doing for me right now where I don't even know she's doing them. It's work that she's created for herself that because she's so high level and senior that she's just doing it and not even letting me know she's doing it. And then every once in a while, something breaks. I'm like, hey, what happened here? And she's like, oh yeah, something broke in this system. And I'm like, what system? Oh, well, I'm doing this. Oh wait, why are you doing that? And I, I'm, I'm finding, oh my word, my kids have grown up and they're doing their own thing. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and, um, and, and so, <laughs> well, that, and the, so, I mean, go ahead. that's just an example of you've got, like that's a next level employee in terms of they're yeah. actually de developing the projects, managing the projects. And in that case, Kirsten, like, you know, she manages our podcast and is, she's the producer of it in terms of making sure that it moves to the point of our listeners being able to listen to it. And she has team that she's checking in with and working with. Right. And so, so yeah. he's actually doing the same thing we're talking about, but with her own team members. You, yeah, you know what? You actually just helped me understand it a little bit more, or at least how to explain it here. Because another, in other words, I've actually even delegated that last 10% on almost everything in the podcast to her. I'm not actually going through and checking every little thing on the podcast to make sure it's okay. been done. She's actually my final 10%, and I trust her so much that she's doing my work for me, even in that 10% that's supposed to be reserved for the owner. Yeah. And that's a really fun teammate to have. <laughs> fun. Um, yeah. Let me share a couple of thoughts on on sort of just what are the steps required to train them and what the way we think about it at the factory here. Mm, please. Um, and some of them will overlap a little bit with what you said. Um, so I'm just going to move quickly through them. So the first thing I would say is, uh, and let's let's take a real concrete example, just like a frequently asked question by a parent. Great one is you have a 30 day cancellation policy, but my child wants out this week. Why do I have to pay for another month? Right? So 
Um, the first thing to do is we make sure that we give them real examples of these questions. Like that's, you know, screenshot the email from a parent. Be like, this is the type of question you're actually going to get, right? So that they mm -hmm. see the um, questions. They see the situations that they can expect to encounter. Uh, again, keep it real always. Don't fabricate these things. You're getting the emails anyways. Just let them see the real deal, right? Next is... Define what success looks like once they've addressed it well. So in other words, a parent in this case says, why do I have to keep paying? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward because my employee needs to get paid, right? It's going to take 30 days to replace your slot with a new student, and they deserve to have a, uh, you know, a predictable wage, right? So it's it a people-centered policy. So then um, what's the result? The result is that the parent accepts that the policy on the 30-day cancellation is fair and you guys part ways admissibly. That's what success looks like. So, uh, and then finally, back to your point, you're showing them and you're shadowing them. That's the last really essential piece of training. We don't need to go into it anymore but because we've talked a bunch about how to shadow. But we're there yeah. showing, they get to watch you do it, and then you get to watch them do it. So we've talked about mentoring and what it looks like to have a teammate that you can trust to delegate to. We've talked about how to train that person. Here's the next question. What are the conditions and structures that must be in place for you to effectively delegate some task in your studio or school in an effective way? In other words, how do we best support that person? What is an environment in which they'll be able to thrive and actually do that job well. I think there's a couple things that have to be in place for that person to really do their job well. And of course, I mean, technically, the first one is just that you've trained them well. And, and you know, we've already spoken about that. So there's a couple of things I found that have kept my people happy and, and, have, and they have the feeling that they're well supported in the job that they've got to do. Whether it's handling a difficult conversation at the front desk, whether it's doing some marketing task, whether it's doing invoicing, some backend admin task, or if it's a teacher knowing you know how they needed to teach a specific thing uh, or a specific program in the school. So first off, first condition structure that must be in place. I think you must have at least bi-weekly meetings in place with, with a team member that you're delegating stuff to, important stuff to. If you're delegating like, hey, go sweep the floor, probably don't need a bi-weekly person, bi-weekly meeting in place for that person. But if they're doing any of the things I just mentioned a second ago, I think you need to have at least a bi-weekly meeting. And if you really want to mentor that person into someone that you can delegate a lot of stuff to and sleep easy at night, knowing that the job will get done well, you probably need to be at a weekly meeting. And I will tell you that my main two team members, I have had weekly meetings in some cases for years with those people. Oh yeah. So that's the first thing. Second thing, you must have a system for creating systems. So, in other words, there needs to be an instruction manual for your music school. And there must be a system in place, a set of rules for what the systems in that instruction manual look like. So there has to be a defined procedure for creating procedures. There has to be a defined system for creating systems. I think this on its face is self-explanatory. I'm not going to belabor this point. And you can go back to episode 46 and 48 for my talk on how to design systems and, and other really important stuff on delegation. But I really go into system design there. And, and those are some of my favorite episodes we've ever recorded. Right here, Daniel. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, we recorded in that room you're yeah, in right live now. Live yeah, in the absolutely. BK. We, I think we reference those two episodes like every fourth episode. So everybody knows by now, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they know I love those two episodes. So you must have a system for creating systems. And then finally, you must have this fine systems in place for those AR AORs. That's obvious. Yeah, we talked um, about that. If we know that th there must be a system for systems, it implies that there will be systems in place. But there are people who've listened to the majority of the episodes of this podcast and have come to me for consulting or coaching or things of that nature. And I get into their business and they're still not doing it. And, and I'm not dogging on them. They're probably listening to this right now. But it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, I know I need to do that. They just don't. And, and I'm saying that if you expect people to know how to confidently look a parent in the face 
and help that parent feel good about the school's policies and you don't have it documented exactly what they're supposed to say, the tone in which they're supposed to say it, the email follow-up they need to send the next day that makes that parent have a, a, a second good experience, then you're just leaving it up to chance. And if you want to build a business that is somewhat predictable, where you're not putting out fires all the time, you can't leave anything up to chance. You do not, a, a tornado can't go through a scrapyard and create a Boeing 747. There's a lot of planning and design and work that goes into that. Similarly, you're not going to just randomly tell an employee, say, hey, shadow me for a week and see how I handle all these situations and then expect excellence. It just won't happen. And so the way I think I'd end my little rant here would be you can either suffer the pain of putting out fires every day or you can quote unquote suffer the pain of building a systems run business. The good news about the second one is that the pain is only temporary. And then the benefits flow forever. But if you choose to stay in the first one, if you choose to stay in the pain of putting out fires, that's just going to be for the rest of your career. I know which one I'd prefer. You know, we hear it all the time, Daniel, you know, from coaching clients and from our listeners that write in, which is just, you know, why does this feel so hard every week? It feels like I don't have time to work on my business because I'm just constantly, like you said, fighting fires in the business. And yeah, I mean, you don't have to go big. I think one of the challenges is that people immediately start thinking huge. They're like, I'm going to scale up to this. People talk to me about opening multiple locations, yet they don't have a system, like you said, just for answering the parent about the 30-day cancellation policy. Like, we can't do, we can't talk about opening two wow. or three more locations Yeah, yet. We need to just yeah. get an email template written. We just need to get your forecast on the current, you know, location, et cetera. Um, and, and it's not to say that I'm not with them in terms of dreaming. I've got a dream board. There's some really awesome things on there. But the work you're talking about is just what are we going to get done today to support this other person that's actually going to develop, as you said, a predictable, sustainable business. Um, let me add a couple of other thoughts to that in terms of conditions and structures. And then, and then um, let's move on. Just I want to remind all of our listeners that we're talking specifically based on the question that came up, which is that how do we get somebody on our team to address the difficult situations? And I feel like, you know, Daniel, um, we've done a really good job of bringing up all kinds of situations. And, th and the wisdom we're trying to share here is applicable across the board. But the real long-term benefit is when you start to relieve yourself of the difficult situations or the ones you perceive as difficult, right? Because that's freeing up our bandwidth to work on something bigger, right? That's freeing us up. Um, you know, when we think, when we say we're putting out fires, Daniel, usually you could just swap out difficult with fire, right? It's basically just like it's a distraction to us. Um, okay, so a couple of things. Again, I love what you said. There's got to be a we. There's got to be a meeting on there. And you know what it means is that you, the owner, actually have to block on your calendar committed time. Right? It's not like, hey, let's meet again next week sometime. No, no, no. It's a, just a regular, recurring meeting. Right? That's committed to getting these people all the way point of success. The second is is that there's got to be some kind of system for you to follow up. Right. And that might be the meeting or it might just be something as simple as you remind yourself once a week to shoot them a quick note to slack them and be like, how's everything going? Feeling good about it? The last thing I'll say is that um, or it's sort of twofold, but there actually does need to be some kind of open channel that's available to them 24 seven to ask anything they need. And we just do it by setting up specific channels in Slack. So that when that desk person's there, of course they're going to have a question that we didn't anticipate. And so they need to be able to just fire off a question in Slack without interrupting you or somebody else, and that you can then get back to when you actually have time. So they need to have that channel that they can put something in there, because I will just forewarn you right now, especially if it's a desk person taking on a number of areas of responsibility, you do not want them stopping you in the hallway to ask you questions whenever they have one, right? Because then all of a sudden your system for training 
starts falling apart pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to tell a tale on myself and just say that uh, I couldn't agree with you more there. Because again, I, I know this is the third time I brought it up, but in this Instagram project we did recently, there were times where I could feel my frustration level rising mm. because so many questions were being asked of me. However, what I will say is that in those circumstances, they absolutely were necessary. There was no way that the other people involved could do their job well without having asked them. What I'm, what I'm highlighting here is that I am so thankful that 100,000 other questions weren't asked during that time because they were handled. So, so it just reminded me like, oh, wow, this is how I would feel every day if I was constantly getting asked questions that could have been handled in an instruction manual for the school yeah, or yeah. something like that or in a better communication channel or an asynchronous communication channel. Couldn't agree with you more there, Nate. And I'm going to throw a slight wrench into your your response there, Daniel, because Ooh, yeah, there are... Controversy. Yeah, I want to just throw this in there. And I was I actually just opened up our Slack to see if I could grab a quick real-world example because oh. I know our listeners know that that's what interests me the most is just what's actually happening. <laughs> working or not working um, at the factory. Uh, but... There are times for sure where people are like, hey, Ben, how do you do this thing, you know, for teaching this part of the songwriter's journey at BMF? Like, and they slack him. And I notice that, well, I know he's not going to respond because he's teaching all afternoon, but then he comes back. And before he has a chance to respond, the person has said, actually, I already figured it out. I'm all good. And so there's a level of... Um, there's a level of faith that you have to have in giving them space to solve their own issues. And so that's the only thing is like, you know, of course, if it's a creative project where you're trying to align on exactly what the end product's going to be, i.e. maybe an Instagram, um, you know, sort of like what's the voice that you're trying to put out there and you needed fast feedback to get alignment on it. That's something unique. But I'm just going to put that out there that oftentimes... I will very purposely not respond to a question for like 12 hours. I'll give a good example of this. And I think this is actually useful to folks because I know that people who are listening to the podcast or watching it on YouTube really like the specific examples. I know because they told me. Mm. There was a project we did recently. An, uh, it was a marketing project this time where a long period of time had gone where there were some parts of it that I was supposed to do but the reason I was supposed to do them was that the person who was working on the project with me said, oh, yeah, I can't do that. You're, I'm going to need your help there. I'm going to need your input there. I'm going to need you to do this. And I just took that. And then the project languished. Yes. For an embarrassingly long amount of time, actually. I'm not even going to say how long, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I was in my annual planning at the end of 2023 going into 2024, I was just looking at how things were going and trying to tie up loose ends for the coming year. And I just saw this embarrassing project that had just sat in a shelf collecting dust essentially. And I sent an email to someone and I said, look, here's the deal. I'm coming to realization that I probably put too much on my plate here at the back half of 2023 and there's a bunch of stuff that I'm just deciding I'm not going to complete. And I'm going to be handing some of those things off to other people. And then there are some things I think that have been asked of me that I don't think should have been asked of me. And so I'm going to tell you, this, <laughs> this needs to be online. This needs to happen. And I'm not doing it. So you need to figure it out. Mm. It was done in a week. Yeah, well, there's this had been this had this project had languished for a long time, and this person had insisted that they needed my input, and it was just one of those things where it was fiddly, it was super detailed, it was like it, and, and I said to this person, "No, you need to get this online," and it was done in a week, and ooh man, I wish I'd done that earlier. <laughs> well, and, and Daniel, that gets to how we open this episode because we're mm. you know we're coming to the close here, but. You open by saying spending enough time with a person to get to know where their strengths and weaknesses lay and and mm -hmm. then trying to align with their strengths. 
And in truth, that story highlights like, you know, we don't always get it right. Sometimes we think we are the Savior, like we're the only solution. But I would just say that, um, you know, there's always, always so much more opportunity in every one of our team members than we initially realize. And that's only due to our own perspective on it. And I, in the 14 years at the factory, I have come to realize that everybody just has, it's, it's not unlimited in their potential, even though it is in a meta sense, but on the job site, people are capable of doing a lot more than we might give them credit for. And usually it's because I haven't taken the time to discover all the opportunities. Yes. Now, I have no pushback on that. The flip side of that coin is sometimes team members might see the boss as a shortcut to getting something done. Mm. Oh, you're so much better at this than I am. Well, of course I am. Right. I'm 15 years older than you and I've been doing this for 20 years, you know, like, of course. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, that isn't even an ego statement. It's just a statement like when you're yeah, when you're my age, you'll be this good, too. You know, <laughs> like. um, Right. And so for me in, in that situation, I don't want people listening to take the wrong lesson away from what I said there. The, the solution to some of your problems isn't just to bark orders at the team and say, oh, yeah, just get it done. I knew the two team members who were involved in this project with me and and I just and I just thought why why are why are they waiting for me? Yeah. You, yeah. So I knew that they could do it. Right. So uh it's yeah. I mean that's the, it's complicated sometimes. Yeah. And that's a last really good point around experiential knowledge. Like of course you may be the most qualified on the team right now, but you're not it's not the best use of your time. Um, 100%. That's exactly the issue at stake. I completely agree. Yeah. So let me let me uh, kind of begin to close this out with just sharing a couple of thoughts <laughs> on right. um, like, you know, you have a couple of great questions. Number one is, how do we know that they're definitely ready to handle difficult situations? Well, I think we already talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, but you mm. might have some additions to that. Um, I just highlighted that sort of the most obvious point to me is that we don't even hear about the difficult yeah. situations anymore. We don't see the emails. They don't get forwarded to us. Um, the number of times that we're being asked for help uh, goes way down on that particular situation or that particular mm -hmm. frequently asked question. Um, and then the last sort of way to kind of, um, or a last really important question that I think that we've we brought up around this initial listener's question was, well, like how much time do I have to devote to this whole training process? Um, mm. And I would say two things, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, Daniel. The first is it completely depends on the complexity of the uh, situation you're training them on or the project you're training them on. Um, but I would say you're not spending any less than a solid week if it's a simple, hey, FAQ, this is how you do it. You probably have a couple of meetings, but you're likely spending no less than four weeks. And it's probably it could be many months, depending on what the thing is that you want them to take on. Um, perfect example is your Instagram project. That was probably like 14 to 18 months all told. So I only have a few thoughts on this kind of closing out because a lot of the th a lot of the thoughts like you, I think, have already been communicated. But I will just say that I've been more precise, a little bit more punch list or checklist based in some of the previous questions here, I'm going to be a little bit more touchy feely. I think intuitively, you know, when someone's ready for more responsibility. And a lot of times the way I test it is just to, to give them one or two things that are above their current responsibility level and see how they handle it. Just throw them in the fire. Now, that might sound awfully cavalier given the precision that I was talking about before, but sometimes you just have to do a little test. Hey, try this out. That's actually the reason why the direction of actually both Kirsten and Bethany's time with me moved in a certain direction. They were both part-time assistants at one point. They're now full-time for me. It's because I gave them like little test projects. 
little test tasks. And the other thing I would say is look for that energy there. Do, do they have energy for the job? Now, what's often fun is that when you invest into someone, a lot of times the investment comes back to you. Not all the time. And it's not tit for tat. You invest because it's the right thing to do. But when you do that, you will notice that some people give you a lot more energy back than others. And it's those people that give you a lot more energy back. Those are the ones that you, you then begin to develop, I, I would say, more of a special relationship with. And, and that has been the case. There are other team members I've had in the past where I could tell for them it was just a paycheck and they were doing great work. I'm not going to knock them, but they, they weren't my long-term people. And they were, you know, they played the role that they needed to play at the time. Again, not knocking them. So that's how I would answer the question of how do you know they're ready to handle the difficult situations other than all the, the checklists I gave before earlier in the episode. The other thing is how much time does it take? And <laughs> that one, once again, uh, we'll go back to the more checklist based stuff really simply. The system for building systems, you could have that up and running in the school in a month or less. Building the systems, that never ends. There, As long as you're building the school and it's not a place where it's like, oh yeah, it's done. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> then you're going to be building systems or you're going to be refining systems. I look on my timesheets for some of my team members and every month there'll be a little bit of time that was dedicated to updating a system. They'll even designate which one it was. It was oh, sweet. That's Didn't cool. even ask him to do it. Love it. Yeah. They just know that it's part of the job. Third thing, how much time does it take to develop a human? How much time does it take to build a great relationship? That's a lifetime project. And to that end, we never end there. And as long as these people are with me, I really love them. And I'm always going to be building into them. And when you have that kind of mentality that you're just building into someone for someone's sake. You know, I'll be dead someday. We'll, we all will be. Um, and our businesses will eventually go away. We'll sell them. They'll fail. Or we'll just lose interest in them. Or we'll move on to something else. Or we'll hand them off to someone else. Or we'll give it to a child. The thing that will most matter is the relationships we had. Period. And to that end, I think that the time that it takes, that I don't much care about. Because as I see that they're giving that energy and they're doing their best, if this person does it in three months, but this person takes a year, I kind of don't care. Uh, and, and to that end, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we can actually measure that, but we can measure the impact that we're having on each other. And I think that's a really cool thing. Mm -hmm.